Welcome to another episode of Our Interesting Times. It is my pleasure to have Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson back on the show. He, he returns to discuss the opium wars and neoliberalism. He is working on a piece, working title is Liberal Warfare, the Opium Wars as the Essence and Apogee of Modern International Politics. Uh, of course, Dr. Johnson is the author of many books, including The Third Rome, Holy Russia, Tsarism, and Orthodoxy, and The Russian Populist, The po Political Thought of Vladimir Putin. His website is rushjournal.org. Um, well, The Opium Wars, um, I, there's a book I have called The Opium Wars uh, by W. Travis Haynes III, Ph.D., and Frank Sinello. And they have a quick intro here. I thought I'd catch what we're going to be talking about tonight. Imagine this scenario. The Medellin cocaine cartel of Colombia mounts a successful military offensive against the United States, then forces the U.S. to legalize cocaine and allow the cartel to import the drug into five major American cities, unsupervised and untaxed by, US, uh, by the U.S. The American government also agrees to let the drug lords govern all Colombian citizens who operate in these cities, plus the U.S., has to pay war reparations of $100 billion, the Colombians' cost of waging the war to import cocaine into America. That scenario is, of course, preposterous and beyond the feverish imagination of most out-there writers of science fiction. However, a similar situation occurred not once but twice in China during the 19th century. In both cases, however, instead of thuggish Colombian drug dealers, it was the most technolog technologically advanced nation on Earth, Great Britain, that forced similar conditions on China. Uh, Dr. Johnson, um, is that a, uh, a fair comparison to the Opium Wars, that imaginary scenario? You know, I cited that book, and um, it, it's an excellent one, because even mainstream writers, I don't care what their background, there's no justification for what the British were doing uh, under Lord, Lord Palmerston in particular. It is a very accurate uh, description, um, and it's probably not powerful enough because – the Chinese addiction to opium was greater than the American addiction to cocaine. So uh, maybe heroin would be, uh, uh, you know, pain pills. That would be a, probably a, a better example. Um, but they were millions upon millions of, of Chinese addicts um, throughout the period of the opium wars. Then, of course, as, as they, the authors mentioned, the treaty that ended the first war forced um, those cities to be open. And then the second war was to have the entire country open. So it was beyond those, those, uh, that group of cities in the first treaty. And it changed China forever. So, um, and it's a basis of neoliberalism. There's no getting out of it. This was, this was where some of those arguments really, politically speaking, took their root. So, yes, it, it, it's an excellent introduction. Of course, the Opium Wars, there were two of them, 1839 to 1842 and 1856 to 1860. Um, what was occurring at the time? Uh, I guess uh, the Opium Wars themselves, we talk about Opium, but it, it involved the balance of trade and uh, Britain's uh, demand or desire for, you know, for China and also for tea. I mean, China, I mean, like, uh, you know, uh, cups and plates and things like that. But China didn't uh, want to trade, uh, uh, I guess they demanded specie, particularly silver. And Britain didn't want to see its reserves drained. So they uh, concocted this plan about, I guess, trading the tea for this crop that was they were growing in India. That's exactly the situation. And um, uh, the, the precious metals going in one direction or another was extremely significant because um, – it used to be that you know the Chinese economy was one of the world's dominant economies. You know this is a highly advanced, high IQ group of people. These aren't savages, and because of the Opium War, it went from a highly civilized, very literate society to something you know vaguely approaching um, uh, the third world. So yes, that's exactly the situation, and. It was uh, grown in, in India, um, which in and of itself is significant because the part of India that um, the opium was grown in, of course, was owned by the British and controlled by it. It was the only part of India that was actually absorbed directly into Britain, uh, so it was even closer than your typical colony, and to make sure that they had full control over the area, they made sure to – 
encourage both Islamic and Hindu nationalists. So as to have a deeply divided society that they could more uh, more easily control. So the massive amount of money that they're making here uh, led to them um, creating this this part of northern India um, to to be directly under London and to create a direct rule that existed nowhere else. Uh, so it was more like Ireland than than a normal part of the empire. And so they pulled out all the stops. The money that they made from this is overwhelming. So much late um, industrialization came from this trade. I mean, it created such capital, such a massive uh, amount of profits, and of course, specie coming in from from China, who had mountains of it. Um, this this created the modern British Empire. What? Uh, well, we we think of opium and we think of the British East India Company, the British Empire. Uh, but it turns out, of course, the corporation, the British, uh, the British East India Company, also uh, the British Empire itself, uh, by this time more or less become a front for certain interests. Is that a, a too much of an over? Is that an oversimplification? Or is that true? No, it's it's absolutely true. When you ask yourself who profited from opium, it certainly wasn't Britain in some abstract sense. Uh, it was the Sassoon family. They are one of the most powerful families of the 19th century. They initially were founded by David Sassoon, who um, uh, already had kind of one foot in the Eastern world because he traded in Oriental rugs and he used sweatshop labor um, to make a small fortune with that kind of thing. He developed a textile trade in, in Central Asia. Um, so Indian yarn and opium were carried to China, where then he brought the goods that you mentioned and brought that back to um, to Britain, and then he used uh, Lancaster uh, uh, cotton products. So he eventually sends his son uh, Elias uh, to Canton, where he was really the first Jewish trader there, and he, they created the you know, Shanghai British Concession. It became the firm's, his firm's second hub of operations. In 1844, he created the branch in Hong Kong, and it became the center of the, um, of the trade. Uh, Sir Edward Sassoon married uh, Baron Gustav de Rothschild's daughter, uh, Aline Carolyn. And then he was sent to Parliament because of the wealth that was generated from, from drug sales. He also became – he was knighted as well. So the company came under under E. D. Sassoon, and of course it was the that part of the British East India Company that had a monopoly, a state granted monopoly patent um, uh, over this trade, and so they impoverished wherever they went, and you know almost literally sucked the money out of um, um, uh, of of China and India because when, when the American Civil War broke out, Europe lost its source of cotton. So that made the Sassoons, who were already uh, growing in Egypt and Central Asia, uh, tremendously wealthy to begin with. And that's where some of the, their initial capital came from. And so they had a monopoly of that as well. And so between opium and cotton, especially during the Civil War, um, the Sassoons uh, were equally just as powerful as the Rothschilds. So it's an extraordinary thing. The uh, Sassoon family itself, they were, quote, uh, court Jews in the Ottoman Empire, correct? Um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head if, if they got their start in, in Turkey. Um, they, their, their main branch was in France. I don't know. I don't think – I don't believe that they were, they were Sephardic. I could be wrong on that. Sassoon isn't your ordinary uh, Jewish name. Um, but – there's no question that they had concessions in Turkey mm -hmm. because so many of the Jewish you know, the Jewish empire really had a center, center there because the Islamic empires were always very philo-Semitic and they were um, absolutely in control of international trade in the Turkish empire. They were in charge of the finances um, and they <clears> – <throat> taking, taking uh, Islamic-sounding names, both Turkish and Arabic, they um, – they really took over uh, the finance of the entire Ottoman Empire. So whether or not he, his family is from there directly, he certainly had an interest there. And he had family members there. And it became yet one more hub of operations. So whether or not – I don't know if, if that's where he, he's, he's from or not, 
but all the major Jewish families had something going on in Turkey because that was a very philo-Semitic um, um, a part of the world and, and a central hub for the Jewish empire. The, the Opium Wars themselves, the, the, uh, you mentioned 1839 to 1842, uh, then 1850s into 1860. Uh, the immediate cause of the outbreak of the war was, I guess, the Chinese government itself trying to crack down on the opium trade. And uh, this was um, – so more or less – the, by this time, the Sassoon family had enough power to convince or to use the British Navy and British Armed Forces as sort of as a proxy or mercenaries for their interests. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And that's one of the things that really it's they, – they essentially were used as the Sassoon family bodyguard. Um, and wherever his trade interests would go – the British Navy and, and military then for the second opium war, the French Navy and military, were, uh, were a central part of it. You're absolutely right. And you'll see when you study the opium war, you'll see that the arguments, the media control, the, um, the misuse of logic is identical there as, as it is today in almost mm-hmm. every, every respect. <laughs> it's the exact same thing, especially the notion that these drugs can, can cure diseases and – it's your fault that you're addicted, and we believe in freedom of choice, and there's so much more money to be made with free trade versus protectionism, and only uh, uh, barbarian societies have protectionist policies. And whenever um, the Chinese, as you say, uh, tried to crack down, um, there was a guy, uh, a specific guy that was put in charge of this, uh, Lin Zizhou, in 1834, who was assigned by the by the emperor to do this, um, and he cracked down quite vehemently. And of course, the Chinese, for a short time, won their drug war, both with the use of violence against the traders and treatment, which they had a very advanced system for addicts. And this frightened the the British elites, especially the the powerful Jewish families. And then in the, Amer- in the British press at the time, all of a sudden, they become the slant-eyed, yellow fanatics and barbarians and psychopaths mm-hmm. who are oppressing us. And uh, anti-Semitic, of course, and um, you know they hate Englishmen, and they're going to they're going to kill us and invade England and take us over if we don't do something about it. I mean that that's the absurdity that, that the press in whipping up because you know you can't go to the British population and say let's go fight a war for this Jewish family uh, pushing drugs. So they had to create these uh, false flags and they had to exaggerate, um, you know this this guy uh, uh, Lynn's uh, uh, policies. That they're savage and British people are being killed, and um, they had to create these 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 violent acts um, in order to get people to back the war. So even in that respect, you have the exact same media manipulation as as you do now. You can't just come out and say, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get these people hooked on opium. You're gonna you're gonna you know send your boys to die. They had to create circumstances. They had to create uh, false flags and everything else. Um, to make that happen, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, the the terms of the treaty. Um, c- can you get into the terms of the first and second treaties and how this established, you know, British dominance? Uh, 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 I guess each one expanded the concessions and pretty much gave uh, the Brit, Brit the Brit uh, the foreign power, you know, Britain, particularly the Sassoons, free reign in China. Yes, um, the first one is the most significant because it. It laid the groundwork for not only the treaties against China, but these kind of free trade treaties in general. Um, the Treaty of uh, Tianjin, which uh, actually were, was the, the British, the French, uh, the Russians, and the Americans were a part of this, believe it or not. Uh, and the points were that foreign powers, not just the British, but foreign powers – can establish diplomatic missions in Peking, which, by the way, was at the time a closed city. So they're trying to rip open the entire civilization. Uh, In both treaties, you had um, the port cities being opened for free trade. You can't discriminate uh, Chinese versus versus English trade. Uh, There were 10 cities initially, uh, Nanking being one. Uh, Then you had the right of all foreign vessels especially commercial ships, to navigate freely on the Yangtze River, again, which was a massive attack on um, sovereignty. The right of foreigners 
to travel in the internal regions of China, which had been banned. Much of this country was was banned to foreigners for obvious, obviously good reasons. And then, as you mentioned before, massive war indemnity. Uh, four, four, four million uh, talents of silver, which was the, the method how it was organized at the time, to Britain, and then two million to France after the second after the second war. Uh, so essentially, the way, way these treaties, both these treaties, were organized, it was to take a formerly closed and more or less homogenous society and rip it open for. Um, Western interests, not just drugs, but Western interests in general. And um, after the first war, and there's a book that I that I cite here, um, which off the top of my head I, I I can't remember. I'll find it here in a second. Um, that they deliberately engaged in atrocities um, in Peking. They sacked the emperor's palace. They burnt and destroyed um, – oh, yeah, the book is Liberal Barbarism and the European Destruction of the Palace of the Emperor of China. It came out in 2013, and the reason why it's so significant is that in destroying the palace, you know, they burnt and destroyed what today would be trillions of dollars worth of scrolls and books, um, uh, incredibly, incredible works of art that people would kill for today. And it was destroyed as a matter of, of policy. Um, they, were, they were told to do this. And it's not just to teach them a lesson. It's not just to, to show that, that the British can't be messed with. It was a way to humiliate and destroy the culture. Because Publishton, Publishton and, and, and the East India Company made it very clear that so long as this culture exists, this Confucian-based uh, tradition, family-based, clan-based, uh, royal society functions. We're not going to be able to push not just opium, but all of these goods. Opium was a way to get their foot in the door. So policy was we have to destroy this society. We have to destroy everything that makes them Chinese. Uh, the, the second treaty, by the way, was was written in English, forcing these people to learn it. In fact, the laws that the British were passing in Chinese territory were in English. And that was, again, meant to be humiliating. And I said in the beginning that China was never the same again. Part of the reason that the Chinese civil wars broke out um, uh, in, in, the, in the 1850s was because the Manchu or the, or the Qing dynasty was humiliated to such an extent because of this. Because their armed forces, which, by the way, were harmed by opium use, um, the British were able to buy off generals, buy off local uh, elites, uh, the, the amount of money that they had was so so intense, um, but and so it was it was easy, you know, even though they were wildly outnumbered, to defeat them. The Chinese didn't have um, experience in this kind of thing. They weren't Machiavellians. They didn't have a massive colonial empire. They weren't used to this kind of mentality. Um, so, in ripping open the society, literally ripping it open, it wasn't just about getting them hooked on opium. It was about getting them literally dependent on Western trade, Western goods. And you see in this period of time after the 1860s, Chinese start cutting their hair in a European way. They start uh, – they abandon you know, kung fu and they start learning boxing and you know, Greco-Roman wrestling, stuff like that. Uh, more and more people start learning English. The Confucian stuff of course, starts being made fun of. And um, this ripped society, society to pieces. Uh, because the civil war then breaks out in China in the in the 1850s, um, because of this. But by the way, one of the bloodiest wars um, ever fought was the Taiping Rebellion in 1850. Uh, it was 20 million people. The entire country was convulsed, and the Taiping Rebellion was about you know the, the Qing Dynasty being unable to fight the British and the French. So you're talking about you know. 20 million people at a, at a minimum being killed in this generation in Russia, the entire culture humiliated, the Manchu dynasty humiliated, the monarchy humiliated, palaces up in flames, not because they needed to, but because this is how they were going to break these people. So now 
They're going to want Western goods because, of course, the British are so far superior to you because we can do this to you. And therefore, because you're humiliated, you're going to want our stuff and want to buy things and uh, want to dress like us and everything else. This is, we talk about globalization today where we see the exact same thing going on. You know, the destruction of the pal- you know, palaces and museums in Iraq and, and things like that, and Yugoslavia. Um, this is where it gets its beginning. And this was a matter of policy. They actually wrote this stuff down. This is what we have to do in order to uh, get them dependent on us. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was reading about Sassoon and how they established uh, some textile mills. And uh, at first they used, you know, again, as mercenaries, British armed forces, Navy and, and an army to go in and suppress and control these regions, put down rebellions and maintain mastery of the area. And then they, uh, I think decades later, they moved those factories too, from out of uh, Great Britain to, to uh, Asia. Which is very similar to what's done. It's been done in the latter half of the 20th century. Yeah, I mean, it's not like this was, you know, to use our language, some third world place. This was an advanced empire in every respect. So, um, humiliating them like this was, you know, it's it's not like you're dealing with some some inferior group of people who you can easily manipulate. You know, tribes in Africa or something like that that took no work at all to get rid of. This is a tightly homogenous, homogenized, culturally very similar society, despite their their divisions, that couldn't be allowed to function. Um, they did the same thing in Ireland, mm-hmm. you know, a century before, destroying, burning the books, burning the the um, uh, the the records of the, of the traditions, and banning the church and banning the, the liturgical books. The language, yeah, yeah. the language, uh, you know, the penal laws, ban Gaelic. It's a, it's the same thing. This is what globalization is. This is enlightenment. This is how do you create a, a world order based on economics where efficiency is the number one concern and lower prices and more consumer choice is the good of goods. People take it for granted today, but when you think of it in these terms, we realize just how absurd it is. So, yeah, you're heading in the right direction when you're asking these kind of questions because it, it's absolutely, um, absolutely ridiculous how this was done. And the foundation of modern arguments for globalization and internationalization and uh, free trade, because in a political sense, they derive from this era and this war. And of course, the events of, of the opium wars are so, somewhat contemporaneous, you know, with the with the so-called potato famine. I say so-called because there's a genocidal quality to the potato famine. It was intended uh, because of the conditions are imposed upon bread. Uh, on the Irish by the British, but the um, idea of free trade, ex- maintaining exports to maintain interest payments to certain bankers was the main one of the main reasons why uh, food was being exported from Ireland during the peak of the potato famine. Um, so it, it, it's you know you get this, this ideology or just worldview it was regnant at the time, and uh, but uh, the mass marketing opium has been around for a very long time, of course, but it was the British uh, or the Sassoons rather. <laughs> Uh, that uh, started mass marketing. I suspect what it is that they discovered a weakness for it uh, with the Chinese. They could market it, and they could mass market it. This coupled with the, with the humiliation of the, of the country, uh, of the dynasty there, uh, could uh, lead people into despair and a feeling of inferiority, which would, can feed the addiction and then set the process in motion where you can exploit these people for centuries. Is that a correct uh, characteristic of the – or uh, I guess uh, – Description of the strategy there, so the marketing strategy, if you will. That, that's exactly it. And calling it a marketing strategy is you choose your words very carefully, and you're absolutely right. This wasn't something that just kind of happened. This was something that was planned out. This is something that you know, they realized that that this is going to be a tough nut to crack. Opium, you know, at the time, grown mostly in India, but you had some of it in, in Central Asia like you do today. Um, it was something that was used in China sparingly. Some of the elites, some of the wealthy would indulge in it, and people already knew how destructive it was. It was not a mass thing. It was not something that anyone could get their hands on. Uh, in fact, it was a symbol for elite power at one point. Marketing very explicitly, using the Chinese language in, in the 1850s, uh, 1840s and 50s, using the Chinese language, using Chinese um, symbols, getting people to buy this stuff. This is one of the reasons that the emperor panicked the way he did, 
and needed to uh, clamp down on it, not just in the sense that we didn't want it being sold, but the British were creating the circumstances whereby a market would be created. This was the problem. They knew exactly what they were doing, and this is why the Sassoons were so important and the Jewish marketing mentality was so significant here. And, you know, a big chunk of this money went to London, went to uh, the elites, uh, ruling class in London. And that means the Sassoons could do whatever they want. So that's exactly what happened. And, and the Chinese were smart enough to know this is what was, what was going on. And, you know, so on the one hand, the, the society was weakened to some extent before the wars began. During them and after them, it was broken because of it. Again, we're talking about millions and millions of addicts from every strata of society. That was not the case prior to, say, the 1830s, 1840s. That was not the case. That was something that was imposed on them. And like you say, they needed to dissolve the traditions of the society so that they can create not only the despair, the inferiority, and even the notion that by smoking this stuff, we get to be British. We get to be a part of the, uh, of the elite culture, as stupid as that sounds. Because remember, this stuff was illegal in Britain. Any similarities to some for today or more contemporary about how it's been, uh, I guess, uh, drugs in the West, particularly the United States, or the, the cultural peoples of the second half of the 20th century, seeing the ground for these things? Yeah, you think of how the ruling class used rock stars, you know, guys like, you know, you know Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix, where it became cool and rebellious to do drugs. You know, the Grateful Dead, mm -hmm. even sat to some extent. Uh, the songs that they that they wrote um, extolling this kind of thing. Even Frank Zappa, who was very anti-drug, uh, talked about how the regime was very much a part of creating the market, uh, making this stuff cool, making this stuff rebellious. And the kids had no idea who they were who they were serving with this stuff. Well, the same thing happened here. Um, for some kid in, in the late 60s tripping on, on LSD, he thinks that he's a rebel. He thinks he's fighting the Vietnam War. He thinks he's – and yet we all know where this stuff came from. We know, <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah. we, know, we know who Timothy Leary was working for yeah. and what he was both at Harvard and, and with the CIA. So we know this, but most people today and especially at the time thought that this was some act of rebellion. This was cool. And all the bands were doing it, and this is the music that you know, Pink Floyd and and, and the Dead, and all that. This is this is what you listen to, and they associated those bands with the culture, with the drug culture, and they created this market. Look, if the U.S. wanted to crush the drug trade, it could do it in a week. You know this. If the U.S. could destroy the Japanese Empire in a few years. They could do that. They could seal the border off in in two hours, if they wanted to. The fact is, is that they don't want this to be done. There's a big difference between the state and the ruling class. This is also the case in England at the time, because to their credit, there were a large faction in Parliament that was against this kind of thing. Um, Palmerston um, got into some trouble. You know, there were uh, votes of no confidence. There were plenty of people in Parliament saying what you're doing is outrageous. But um, so what, what, is it, what does the country do when they're faced with that? When they're forced to write in their own press, having to having to deal with uh, how do we justify profiting massively on getting an entire society addicted to drugs? Well, they created a false flag. And in this case, it was the so-called Arrow incident. Sometimes um, the Second Opium War is occasionally called the Arrow War. Uh, and what happened is that under the terms of the first treaty – um, there was freedom of navigation, as I mentioned before. In October of 1856, Chinese Marines uh, boarded a ship called the Lorca Arrow on suspicion of piracy. Even though this was owned by Britain, its 14-member crew, 12 of them were Chinese. The Arrow was actually used by pirates at one time, but they were captured, the ship was sold, and then re-outfitted and brought under the East India Company. So, but this wasn't mentioned in the British press at all. Captain was uh, Thomas Kennedy, and he claimed to be there when this was boarded. And of course, he wasn't, by the way. And reporters who knew nothing about China, nothing about the area, created this fiction that the Chinese Marines boarded the ship, they burnt the British flag, 
They insulted the queen. They insulted parliament. These guys were roughed up. They were beaten. A few people killed. None of this is true. The Chinese had every reason to board it. It was very suspicious. It was deliberately created. The, the fact that the Arrow used to be a pirate ship, the Chinese knew knew the exact description. They sent it right by a, a major um, outpost. They knew just what they were doing. They needed to create a false flag because we're at the and this became an electoral issue. This is how Palmerston uh, got his majority. Um, and you know when when they when they voted against him in the House of Commons, it was. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it, it was it was it was close, but Palmerston's faction was getting ready to lose. Of course, Palmerston attacks the the Whigs and he attacks their patriotism. You're not good Britishmen because you're you're in favor of this barbaric culture. But the 1857 election went Palmerston's way because of the Arrow false flag. They created this event, even though it was legitimate from a security point of view, and no one was no one was harmed. You wouldn't know that if you read the press. So um, what they wrote, the so-called arrow incident in the British press, with the yellow slant-eyed savages are stealing our ships for no good reason, and they're violating the terms of the treaty, and our, our boys aren't allowed to trade there, and, um, and they're roughing up England, they're burning the flag, and all this kind of thing. And so before you know it, Palmerston is doing well. Uh, the population is supporting him, supporting uh, the war. And this is one of the things that created the second uh, opium war. That's why it's called the, the Arrow War in some cases. So when they get into trouble, what they do is they create a false flag. That's how close the situation back then is to, to now. This is nothing new what we're dealing with today. So uh, yet another war started at a so-called incident at sea <laughs> or on the river, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, the um, – Opium wars themselves, uh, the opium trade, um, is there an oversimplification to say the opium trade was a Jewish trade? It's not an oversimplification, no. No. Um, at first, the beginning of the 19th century, it would be an exaggeration. But once the British government realized the money that could be made, they knew who exactly to put in charge of this thing. The Sassoons were already over there doing other things, but they, were, they already had the money, they were already over there, and they were going to turn over a lot of the profits to, to the government anyway, so this guy was the perfect man to do this. So even the Jewish Encyclopedia, and I've, in my, my paper I have it uh, cited uh, quite liberally, says that this was a, a national movement. Uh, Sassoon was a nationalist himself, a Jewish nationalist in, in many ways, and, and his corporations, even overseas, only Jews could work there. They did things in, in, in Yiddish and in Hebrew. Uh, 1944 Jewish Encyclopedia makes it very clear that wherever he went, he built synagogues and he imported Jews. He only trusted his own people. And that includes in, in China. Um, he, he created Hebrew schools and you know, wherever he went, it became a little, little Zionist entity. So not only is it a Jewish trade, it's a trade that was uh, financed and supported an explicitly Jewish nationalist movement. So it's a Jewish trade in an extreme sense. It also seemed to have financed how uh, the Jewish infiltration or inveigling into the British establishment itself because um, uh, it was through their uh, you know, immense wealth that they established peerages, uh, you know, uh, knighted. And they were able to intermarry, not just in the Rothschilds, but eventually there's a lot of, in the 19th century, a lot of intermarriage into the British aristocracy, aristocracy itself. A lot of that was driven by, um, well, the ability to loan money because the aristocracy had borrowed a lot of money in the 19th century to build their manor homes and live their lives of luxury. And this, uh, coupled with some other things of the Rothschild intrigues within Britain, Battle of Waterloo, we've heard stories about that, that by the middle of the 19th century, the Bank of England had, was controlled by Rothschilds, and while Britannia ruled the waves, it was Rothschild who controlled the Bank of England. So the Bank, the England, England itself had become a captured state at that point by these interests. That's right. And there was no one in Great Britain at the time that could match the Machiavellian mentality and, and, and the sheer influence and money that the Sassoon um, uh, family had. I mean, they, they rivaled the Rothschilds, and because they married into the family, 
the Rothschilds made sure that there would be no rivalry there. Mm -hmm. So they married into it. They're, they're very inbred in that sense. They couldn't have they couldn't have any rivalry there. So they married into each other. Um, and as I mentioned, several of them were knighted because of this. And although it wasn't it wasn't in the British press at the time that oh yes, our, our glorious Jews or, or, or patriots, it was nothing like that. But the Sassoon family began to be associated with British patriotism. That these are the guys that are carrying the flag for us in the Far East. Again, one of the reasons that the Arrow incident was was so significant. Um, they weren't mentioned by name very often, but when they were, it was always in a very positive sense, and they're associated with um, the patriotic movement of Britain establishing new colonies. You know, Hong Kong, uh, as as wealthy as it is, derives explicitly from this from this era. Um, so you're exactly right. This is this was an extremely powerful way that they infiltrated the society. It wasn't just, of course, China, but they were doing a lot of the same things in Britain itself. And um, their attacks on, on basic law and order uh, in, in England uh, derives from some of this. I mean, it wasn't just China that they were doing this with. Although opium was illegal in Britain, um, you do have some of the rumblings of, of addiction among Englishmen too at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, drug, drugs, are, drugs are symbolic of, as we know from the 60s and early 70s, they're symbolic of cultural revolution in general. Now, once these people take over, like, you know, Castro and Cuba, the Soviets, you looked at a drug there, you're, you're in prison. But they loved using it to break down the older society. And so drugs are a symbol for, for a cultural revolution in general. The sort of ruthlessness involved in the marketing, the selling, and the lack of uh, ethics or morality in in one's conduct, not only personal but also professional business, uh, are we laying too much at the feet of of of, of Jews for this, or is there something uh, in the Western tradition itself that's flawed here? Well, we can't blame powerful Jewish families for what happened entirely. Mm -hmm. They profited. They they were the vanguard. Um, and there was a, a groundswell against the opium trade in Britain. Um, there were attacks on Palmerston. Of course, they had a huge faction. You know, the the, you know, the Whigs, the Whig uh, party was not a big fan of this. It wasn't Gladstone a big opponent of it. He was a big opponent of it. Yeah. Uh, and the Palmerston Gladstone battle over this stuff um, shows you that there was, you know, now to what extent they blamed the Jews for this at the time. It wasn't a common thing, but it did come up. The fact that these are alien families that are marrying into each other, taking over. Um, the peers in certain areas and making a massive amount of money, humiliating Britain by associating the flag with this kind of addiction. Well, another incident, and this is this is one of my, my favorites, is to talk about this pure Machiavelli, the Essing Bakery incident of 1857. This was in uh, this was in Hong Kong, and they claimed that a Chinese-owned bakery was poisoning the mostly British customers. Again, this is one of the things that brought Palmerston back into, into power again. Uh, they were charged with trying to poison the entire city of Hong Kong, which at the time was you know, a huge British, British area. And what happened, this, this bakery was putting arsenic in some of the donuts. Now, the donuts were – there was so much arsenic in it that it was harmless because normally if you consume a lot of it, you immediately throw it up. So they, they knew what they were doing. You have to put a small amount of arsenic in it. That'll kill you. Too much of it, your body will simply um, throw it up. So whoever did this knew what they were doing. You can't put too much in there. And um, because of the public ignorance of, of Chinese in general, they completely concocted. The people who were on trial here were given names. The, the, the owner's name was allegedly Chiang Ah Lum. Now – that's not a Chinese name, but it's a it's a play on words. Chiang Alum was a, a, a mockery um, to the British population. Um, now, even though these people were acquitted, this is this is a name um, that they invented because they used potassium alum to whiten the bread in certain bakeries. So it was a play on words. 
the people who were allegedly on trial for this all over the press, they had names like Chiang Achu, Chiang Aheep, Chiang Achok. None of these are Chinese names. Fong Achut. These are all concocted names. And um, these guys, of course, you know, the British did this. They created this whole thing. There was an owner of that bakery. It wasn't these guys. They invented an entire story and put these guys with these fake, ridiculous names on trial as as people who are who are, you know, mass murderers. The London the London Morning Post called these people hideous. They're monsters. The Chinese um, are, are are hideous villains for doing this. And all over the British press, Chinese bakeries in British areas in southern China are trying to slaughter. Englishman. They even they even said that one of the the owner of the place said that uh, agents of the Manchu uh, government was giving gave him the poison to do this with, which isn't true, of course. It's one of these ridiculous false flags with completely invented groups of people playing on the ignorance of the English population for you know, Chinese things. They invented and fabricated this entire thing. There really was a bakery. There really was a. Uh, 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 an issue here. There really was a huge amount of arsenic that they found in a few things. But because of public ignorance, they invented all of these names. They made it sound like a huge Chinese conspiracy connected to uh, – you see this like in the, the case with the you know, radiation poisoning, allegedly Putin's people were doing mm-hmm. this. Yeah. It's the exact same damn thing. The names are ridiculous that they came up with. They knew that no one was going to know any better. And the, the, the vicious uh, language that they used. So the, um, the Essing Bakery incident was a way, despite the fact that, by the way, the, the owner was acquitted. But the election took place before the court decision was handed down. This wasn't these guys' names. These guys never said that the Chinese government is, was financing us to, to poison everybody. And the fact that it was so badly done, you know, the Chinese know what they're doing in this respect. If they actually wanted to kill someone, they'd, they'd do it, and they wouldn't do it in such a stupid way as the bakery that even Chinese people go to in Hong Kong. But it was something that frightened people. They associated it with all these Chinese names, all these long list of – they didn't know that they weren't Chinese names. They simply invented it. The press went crazy, and so the average Englishman had it in their head that there was this massive genocide – that the Chinese were going to engage in against Englishmen. And this is how uh, one of the ways that Palmerston stayed in power, one of the ways that Gladstone and the Whigs were defeated, and one of the ways that these wars uh, continued. And this was between the, the two opium wars to justify it. And this is how they did it. So, of course, you can't say, oh, yeah, we're getting them all addicted to opium so our friends can get rich. You can't say that. So you have to do ridiculous things like this. And to the point where the press was simply inventing these names that weren't even close to Chinese names, playing on the ignorance of the population. It's infuriating, partially because we see it being done every day today, whether it be Arabs or Russians especially. Uh, The Chinese knew that if they ever did anything like this, that would guarantee a war against their population. It would guarantee the British were never going to leave. It would guarantee the killing of Chinese people. It's absurd for anyone to think that they would ever do something like this. Um, and the same thing with, with Russia or, or, or Iraq years ago um, harming Americans in any way. That guarantees a war against them. It makes absolutely no sense. And this is where some of this stuff got started. The fact that these false flag attacks and incidents, whether it be the Arrow or the Bakery, um, are almost identical to what they're doing today. It's absolutely infuriating. The uh, opium trade itself was so immense and uh, so profitable that, it, of course, it attracted interest. And, of course, the Americans got involved. This is the, you know, the Russell family. And, of course, Yale University itself, I think its name, taken from uh, a, a gentleman who worked for the British East India Company who made his fortune largely from the opium trade. Uh, but, of course, the Russell Trust itself uh, went on to form or at least pay for the creation of Skull and Bones. And Skull and Bones is a secret society, uh, for, at least uh, for the longest time, a lot of influence in, um, well, controlling who who got rich, who got powerful, who was named certain positions without the U.S. government. Um, the, 
so we have this again uh, with with the American establishment, with the intelligence OSS, and then CIA uh, was the skull and bones, and this tr again the establishment um, creation of the American establishment, the Boston Brahmin, the elite in America, also tie back to the opium trade and the drug, you know, so the, and the drug trade in general, and. A lot of Americans don't realize this, but you know the, the banks, the insurance companies, the you know, the wealthy families all tie back to this uh, to this trade. Uh, what does that say about uh, you know about sort of the uh, I guess you could say uh, international banking financial system today? Because it all comes from it all pretty much stems from this from this from these origins, correct? Yeah, you're talking about the the very beginning of the victory of the Industrial Revolution. Of course, industry had been developing uh, slowly but surely, but, but now, 1840s, 1850s, you have a massive explosion of it. Well, where did that capital come from? There has to be a massive influx. You know, how expensive is it to build you know, steel mills? That doesn't come from a normal economy. It doesn't come from the day-to-day -day function, even, even of the empire. Now, you need a source of capital so tremendous that you could then plow it into these uh, really a, a brand new way of life. And that's why the opium trade was so important because the sheer amount of money that these guys made, not just the, these Jewish families, but also the British government, uh, the French and the Americans to a much lesser extent, uh, as you mentioned, Yale University, all of these elites, they're all tied together. And one of the reasons that you have secret societies is to tie them together without being publicly tied together. Um, and, of course, Yale and these places, they're, they're on, the, on the British model. This is where this gigantic pile of money came from and created the robber barons. It, it created this – there was always an oligarchy, but nothing like this. This created our modern separation, not just rich and poor, but then you have this super rich ruling class that lives a completely different lifestyle than everybody else. Then the rich underneath them, then everyone else underneath them. This is where this comes from. This didn't exist. You didn't have this – and the empires of the ancient world, it didn't exist. The money wasn't there for this kind of inequality. This is where it comes from. And they needed to be able to use this terrible drive for people to be to, to get high um, for pleasure. Once you harness that drive, you can make all the money you want. And you think you just you just substitute you know sex for drugs, and you have you know America in the last in the last fifty years. Whoever can control these drives. Whoever could can control and profit from would be the male sex drive or the or alcohol or getting high, these low-level drives. Whoever can control them and use them for their own benefit is going to be immensely powerful. So it's not just where the capital came from to build the advanced industry. This is where it came from. But also the mentality that was created to allow this stuff to be built and to develop a market that will find it's not really a problem. That's where this all comes from. Sex drugs uh, for the last 120, 130 years or you know, slightly more than that, it's been the capitalist mantra of the West. This is how you get people to go along with a program that otherwise they would want nothing to do with. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, uh, who does control the production of pornography, drugs, and alcohol historically? <laughs> Oh, the Hindus. Did you know that? <laughs> the Hindus. We've got to do something about them. You know, they're nothing but a problem. Um, you know, I mean. Well, let's say vices, right? Uh, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's, again, it, it's demonic in the sense that these vices have always existed. But it took this era and this mentality to create a civilization based on them. Um, there'd be no, no one would ever send their kids to die for something like this unless they were getting something. And what was developing in the 19th century is the breakdown of the old order, the breakdown of the old virtues, and the idea that pursuing your self-interest, uh, pursuing what you think pleasure is, is the basis of a happy life. Prior to this, that concept was absurd. But industry needed that mentality. You needed to create a market. Um, opium was becoming a problem in the West at this time. 
uh, you needed a market. You needed that kind of mentality that's willing to purchase and buy things and, and associate your own happiness with the regime. See, because if you accept the idea of pursuing your self-interest, and capitalism demands that, the free market is based on pursuing your self-interest. Well, if you as, a, as an ordinary you know, middle-class guy, if you're pursuing your self-interest, sex, drugs, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, promoting yourself, then you have no place to stand to criticize these people because they're doing the exact same thing you are. And it seems like such a simple notion. I mean, I, I first read that in E. Michael Jones and Libido Dominandi. That huge book is based around that one concept. If you're following your own pleasures, what you think of pleasure is, and you know, indulging yourself in all these kinds of things, and you defend your right to do that and get all upset when someone tries to stop it, if you accept that lifestyle, you can't criticize these guys. You can't criticize the Sassoons or these multi-billionaires because they're doing the same thing that you are. And you probably would want to be one of them if you could. So this is a revolution. And so what was happening in China was also happening in the West, not as blatantly. But in dismantling, in the Chinese case, it was literally dismantling the old society. This is also going on because in, in industry destroyed the countryside. It destroyed the old uh, manor system. It brought millions of people in from the countryside to, to live in the cities. It created an entirely new, different human being. It created the proletarians and bourgeois, bourgeoisie. The whole concept of a proletarian uh, came into existence at exactly this time. The Communist Manifesto was put out in 1848. Without this stuff happening, um, those distinctions in our class life wouldn't have made any sense because they couldn't have existed. Yeah, and in Barrett Metal, E. Michael Jones makes the point that uh, Marxism or socialism is a re is a reaction to laissez-faire capitalism, um, and then um, the reaction to Marxism itself, and then it becomes libertarianism, but they're all materialistic. They're, the revolution has, has still occurred in, in the outlook. Um, he writes, um, the, the loss of proper philosophical perspective had consequences for the whole concept, study, and appraisal of economic life. The triumph of the mechanical conception and the universe led to the corruption of the science of economics. It brought about the submersion of the moral order in the physical order. The reaction to Hobbes, the Elizabethan police state, and the mercantilism did not bring about a return to the moral law as the natural locus for understanding economic transactions. Instead, a century or more after Hobbes, the early proponents of classical liberalism imagined that they had solved the problem by postulating the existence of an inherent benevolent mechanism that turned private avarice into a social blessing. The late scholastic failure to reassert the hegemony of moral philosophy over economic exchange, coupled with the rise of scientific pseudophysics, led to the rise of the impersonal market, itself a pale imitation of the mechanism of the Newtonian universe as the best arbiter of all economic exchange. Well, you know, E. Michael Jones and I are old friends, and we've been talking about this together for, for several decades now. It's always been my... Um, argument that Thomas Hobbes is the founder of the modern world. Uh, this is several centuries before the Opium War. But his conception of the world was isolated individuals. There are no families. These are isolated individuals fighting one another before there's any government, before there's any society of any kind, fighting one another, uh, just self-interest, you know, factions upon factions, until eventually they get so exhausted that they have to come together and sign the contract that creates the state. And that's what the Leviathan is. Leviathan, yeah. yeah. And this was... He, he's writing an English Civil War period. That's very critical, yeah. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, warfare is necessary for this kind of stuff to be taken seriously. I mean, Thomas Hobbes explicitly says that individuals spring up like mushrooms. He can't even... He can't even give a even a nod to the family system because anything that would interrupt his isolated individual has to go so it's this purely mathematical concept and jones himself said that the newtonian idea comes from the english civil war because when the orange family took over well there was no moral justification for it there was no legal justification for it, it was simple force and the force the money came from the london traders 
Well, if you posit a universe of random interaction and atoms, you know, bouncing off each other, joining one uh, uh, one substance, breaking off, joining another substance, you know, that becomes uh, social life very quickly. That's why these ideologies, uh, Francis Bacon, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Newton, this just random interaction of atoms that don't seem to have any purpose or any real origin, that creates the modern mentality. Without Hobbes, without Newton, you can't have modernity. You can't have industrialization. You can't have the free market. These are the most revolutionary concepts in Western history. There is nothing conservative about a free market. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's a modern Enlightenment idea. And, and he, as you as quoted Jones, and he said this other places too, that there is no need for a moral order. And he's actually citing Adam Smith there, among other people. Mm -hmm. There's no need for a moral order because that will come if you allow individuals the um, the right to simply trade and function, pursue their self-interest, whatever you want. They have to support the social whole if they want to make a profit. You know the argument, right? Mm -hmm. you know, if you're a greedy person and you start your own business, you have to be nice to everybody. They're not going to come to your store. Uh, you have to treat people well or, or you're not going to make any money. So to be greedy means you have to be very socially conscious. Now we know what nonsense that is and the fact that this stuff came uh, – these ideologies came to justify that sort of thing. And I also want to mention uh, you know, Charles Darwin also began writing at this period of time. If you are a British industrialist, if you're a Sasson, if you're a Rothschild, if you are in the Royal Society or the Lunar Society and you're building this overseas colonial industrial empire for the first time, well, Charles Darwin, as well as Hobbes and these other people, that's music to your ears. Because now you don't have to be nice. Now you don't have to care about anybody else. If you posit a world order, so-called natural world order, where species are fighting one another for survival, and when one is victorious, they take the resources that the ones that you've defeated own and absorb it into yourself. Well, that means by me being a greedy uh, 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 industrialist and, 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 and robber baron is not only is it not wrong, but it's part of the uh, part of the natural order. It's not my fault. We're just animals, aren't we? And this is what animals do in the wild. They kill each other. They're in competition. And whoever adapts the best wins. And those who win belong where they are, and they could absorb the resources of their defeated opponent. Talk about music to the – there's no other society that could have ever created this ideology except for 1850s England. That's exactly what these robber barons were doing. So Jones is, is – is, and I, of course, I've been saying this for decades just like, just like Jones has. These ideologies coalesced into, into the modern world and the modern uh, economy – where they completely dispensed with moral theory, as, as Jones said, any kind of natural law. But things like opium, things like rampant consumerism, um, pornography, prostitution, which certainly existed back then, and the Jews have always been associated with, that was necessary not only to make the money, but to destroy the default settings of how people view the world. It changed how people understand things. And all of a sudden, in the British press in the 1850s, 1860s, everything's about consumers pursuing their rights and traders pursuing their rights and self-interest. And that becomes a very good thing for Britain and for everybody else. So you have these revolutions developing in this period of time, along with the massive amount of money that these people need to function and they completely remake the society. And unfortunately, you get the modern world. It's all a lie, too. Because there is no – that really isn't based on voluntarism. It's coercion, just sophisticated coercion, sophisticated psychological warfare. Because there's nothing natural about sending in the British Navy to pry open China for the opium trade. If – you know, you know, that's not – you know, that's nothing natural about – nor is there nothing natural about exploiting one's relative weakness. That's just a position you've taken and you're using these theories of the universe as simply physics. It's just – it's just uh, gravity – Motion, you know, these things, inertia causing these things to justify your own actions. Well, I can chart, I can pay this person a slave wage because he's desperate as opposed to a living wage or a wage that he can live at and maybe even develop a, his skills he can improve by just exploit this massive labor that you're, that a civil war has created overseas. This is what's how the model is done today with disaster capitalism and 
you know, if you're familiar with the some of the research for Castro and Austin Fitz, you know, uh, some, some of the uh, uh, real estate fraud or mortgage fraud, mass mortgage fraud, just stealing, and it's just it's all secretive, and not to, and the role that drugs play in uh, in, uh, in leveraging or, or um, you know destroying communities for a generation, so you can come in and buy it up for a song twenty years later. But it's the same reasoning because you're you're pumping in the drugs. They want the drugs. The drugs destroy the community. The community that this causes property values to plummet because of the crime, and then all of a sudden the area is cleared out and it's gentrified, and you've made money off the real estate. <laughs> you know, it's really this. The whole mentality just pervades everything today. I mean, I'm just trying to think of where this go, goes everywhere in today's thinking. You know, yeah, they're they're the default settings of how people um, conceive of the world. But the problem is, you have to assume that Thomas Hobbes is right. You have to assume. And people don't even realize they're assuming this, that the only real foundation of society is the individual, which, of course, is a, a ridiculous idea since the individual by himself couldn't survive two seconds mm -hmm. without a community because even the family needs a community around him. So you have to assume that only the individual exists. You have to assume that they're – they start off with no culture, no language, no society, the so-called state of nature idea. And then you build society from there, which is you know, Tom, uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Adam Smith created this whole state of nature idea. The state of nature is a revolution. state of nature says there is no order. There simply is these cultureless, void people that pop up out of the ground, and then they posit how they might behave with no religion, no law, n nothing like that. And create your social order based on that. That's what the greatest philosophers in, in, in the modern world do. Uh, Machiavelli did this. Hobbes did it. Uh, uh, Smith did it. Smith's idea of the state of nature is so-called perfect competition, um, the basis of the, of the free market. It's it's no different than than any of these other revolutionary ideas. But but you have libertarians who base their point of view on John Locke, who simply come from uh, Thomas Hobbes or or uh, Adam Smith, that's in the same tradition, uh, utilitarianism versus versus rights-based theory, but it, it turns out to be the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You have to assume that's true. Then all this other stuff falls into place. But it's, it isn't true. It is a lie. There is no such thing as an abstract individual. There is no such thing as an abstract person. We're always born into a social order in a society, and we couldn't function at all. I mean, the very language we use is an ancient cultural artifact. Nothing belongs to us. And this egocentrism is absolutely pathological. That with, with Hobbes and, and, and Newton, these, these, these so-called scientific ideas that posit, and you have to assume that the world is meaningless, that it's atoms in the void, individuals clashing into each other. You have to assume that. You can't, you can't prove that because you need that assumption in order to prove anything. So it's circular. That's just the modern scientific mentality is based on this kind of thing. You have to you have to accept nominalism. You have to accept empir uh, empiricism. You can't prove that stuff. That's the that's a method of proof itself. So you have to assume all this stuff is true before you begin thinking like it. And one of the ways that you break out of modern thinking is to recognize the sources of this thinking. And once you realize it, and this is why E. Michael Jones has been so important to me personally intellectually and so many people um and that's why jones is is as influential as he is is that he ripped the whole thing open you know explaining that this stuff didn't just happen there's nothing natural about the free market the free market is a revolutionary idea that had to be imposed on a society by force otherwise no one would accept it and in this case when you posit the individual as an abstraction all you have is their base desires in hobbes case it was just survival Everything comes from that. Any lust, any drive uh, for power comes from this internal need to survive. Even, even Darwin had the same thing. Um, therefore, the base drives, the base passions is what motivates everybody. But again, you have to assume that. And that's how they start their theorizing. And that's what the modern world is based on. Now, they have the money. They have the mechanism. They have the opportunity. They have the motive. And the fact that Jews are so alien from the moral tradition – they are the ultimate, uh, Jones says this as well, they're the ultimate nominalists. 
because there is no meaning in the world. The world is dead except for what they can create out of it. They yeah. alone are, are alive. They're golems, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's you know, the foundation that the Kabbalah is based on, this yeah. whole will to power. Um, so that's – again, you have to assume all this is true, but the Jews are significant because they already had the ideology. And now they have the money. They have the power. Now they have the influence, and they have the mechanism with either consumption or sex or drugs. Now they can do it, and that's our problems um, stem from this. It's a long way to get there intellectually, but there's no question about it. This is where it comes from. Well, our liberal, our liberal polaristic societies are, are, are vulnerable to this, uh, these blandishments and these corruptions, these seductions. In fact, I'd say – I would argue they were created for that very thing is the idea that you break apart the integral traditional society, create a pluralistic, pluralistic society where everything's relative and I'm okay, you're okay. Well, that is very vulnerable to a group that does act in concert and is very cohesive uh, in pursuing their own interest. And we see it today's rhetoric where to deny Jewish interests and deny the right to pursue their interests is anti-Semitic. And to acknowledge that there are Jewish interests is anti-Semitic or to acknowledge that there may be some other ethno-religious interest to compete with their interests is anti-Semitic. So we're trapped. <laughs> I mean, it's Well, <clears throat> you're, you're not trapped if you don't care. No, rhetorically trapped. If, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, no, I understand exactly yeah, yeah. what you mean. I mean, I, you know, in my case, you know, I'm public in this stuff. Mm -hmm. Our people are scared to death because they have, you know, jobs and normal lives. I certainly don't have uh, a normal life where they're very vulnerable. They have to be careful. Now, eventually, they're going to find you out. Mm -hmm. Everyone listening to this show, they're going to find you out, and you're going to be in trouble. There, there's no getting out of this. Uh, rhetorically trapped with the notion of anti-Semitism, you can't talk about anything in this world without mentioning um, uh, the Jews. Like uh, uh, Joe Sobern used to say in the 90s, he would say, talking about American politics without talking about the Jews is like talking about the NBA without ever mentioning the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> uh, the the then know, dominant basketball team in the NBA, yes. <laughs> the then dominant, yeah, exactly. But you can't. Yes. It, but when you are forced to not mention them, you get a ridiculous, distorted view of the world. Yes, that's what I've found in recent years. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. But this is going, and I'll say this again: this is this is a time of suffering. There will be a time where you will get into trouble for supporting this stuff and understanding this stuff, and you're just going to have to. If I can make it, anyone can make it. This is a time of suffering. You know, I understand some of our people have to hide because they they have young families and they have jobs and everything else, but it's just a matter of time. They can crush people. They can throw us in jail. They can do these terrible things to us, but they can't crush the truth. That always – I don't care what ideology they use. I don't care how many drugs or, or, or you know, porn bras they, they send at us. Um, the truth isn't going away for that reason. Yeah, I mean he, uh, in uh, – I forget what book it was. It might have been Baron Metal or the Jewish Revolutionary Spirit, but uh, he talks about the modern world itself. And really by the 20th century, the modern world had become Freemasonic. It's one big Freemasonic temple. And it's, it's through Jujera Masonry that the world has been converted to this. Um, a lot of collusion by Gentiles though. I mean so there's a lot of guilt, a lot of gu uh, guilt, uh, whether it's you know uh, just by not saying anything or going along with it. Um, because there simply aren't enough of them to control the world, or at least to exert the influence that they have. So they they rely on on um, you know uh, I guess uh, you know uh, I guess uh, what's the term Sab saboy goy or what's that term? Uh yeah yeah um the Sabbath goy Sabbath goy yeah yeah you, you do things on the Sabbath that a Jew can't do yeah you end up being his uh, step and fetch it on on Saturdays yeah um. But I guess it's interesting because if you look at the modern society, and he, he Michael Jones, does say things like, you know, it's the, it, the society's been Judaized, Judaized, and that's been that's coming uh, something that's since the Reformation itself, where it's it was a Judaizing enterprise, and I guess the curious support that people like, um, uh, you know, like uh, Cromwell got to. Uh, to uh, uh, fight the civil war against Charles I and ultimately behead him, his support from you know I guess Jews over in Holland, but, you know, uh, but uh, you know, but they talk about them uh, uh, how every Reformation, Reform movement, Revolution movement always had prominent or over uh, over representation of Jews in it, uh, supporting sort of the subversion of traditional society to create the liberal order 
so they create the modern world as we see it today. Um, uh, but um, again, it, it, it's this philosophical corruption, as he said, in, into the West, born out of, I guess, the, the Reformation, with the the, the sort of the um, the uh, Newtonian worldview, which was very uh, very convenient for, again for the. Uh, then at the time, I guess England, the the uh, upstart aristocracy, which had seized church property, and then wanted a sort of an ex post facto, ex post facto rationalization for their theft, and they got that with this Newtonian world, and then that was that that was uh, perfect for the oncoming industrial revolution. And and as you can, as you point out, the justification for seems like the opium trade, which again provided the seed capital, the resources for this industrialization, which created a further divide between the the technoc technocratic West and the traditional, you know, non-West um, would uh, uh, establish dominance, at least te technological dominance of the West for the for the next century, and set set up for the you know set up for the situation we see today. Uh, and you know, as you point out, is it, it it allowed such an immense concentration of wealth that this class almost w would create a breakaway civilization in a sense. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. You know, as you were talking, a, a few things came to mind. I remember Abby Hoffman uh, talking about the riots in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Jerry Rubin and Hoffman used to do is they would send naked girls, the hottest ones they had, to the National Guard or the cops in riot gear and say, if you, you know, take off your uniform, come home with me. Um <laughs> And I did this often. And um, now that's that's a symbolic idea. Uh -huh. You have to be able to 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 tell people to say no to that, mm -hmm. which is really, really, really hard to do. I, I have a tough time with that. Most normal guys do. Um, or, you know, something uh, getting high or, or, or you know, uh, being able to say no to that, saying no to a party. Uh in favor of a more abstract long-term conception. I mean, how, how do you compete with that? How do you say no? I mean, so you think of the power that these guys have, because when you're able to... Especially with mass it, marketing, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. When you're able to provoke the lower passions, the discipline that you have to have to say no, I'm not as, as wonderful as that is, I can't do it, um, not everyone's going to have that. And you see how easy it is to subvert a society. When you have the, the mass marketing, when you have the money and you have things, that's why pornography and, and, and sexual revolution is so essential. You're essentially telling people, no, to stay celibate and to follow the moral order. Well, that's really hard to do when your girlfriend's really hot. And she's, and there, she, and she's willing. <laughs> yeah, and there she's willing. Yeah. And you know that if you say no and if, you, if you're virtuous, then you have to deal with the fact that, number one, lots of other guys have been there. And you have it because you're trying to be a good guy. So they get all the fun and you get you get nothing. And number two, that because she does want to be seen as attractive, she's going to go up to someone else. So you're going to lose twice. So how the hell do you tell the average guy that this is a life we have to lead? Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. And I failed in many respects. Most of us have at one time or another because it's extremely hard to say no. That's the power that these people have. That's what E. Michael Jones, that's what Libido Dominandi is all about. Whoever is able to control and justify the deliberate provocation of the lower passions is going to win. The only thing now that we have is that we are seeing the end result of this. We're seeing the destroyed families. We're seeing the suicides. We're seeing the irrationality, the mental illness, the drug addiction. Now we see the long-term results of what that short-term pleasure-seeking idea creates. Um, I've said this a million times, and, and, and it's the orthodox point of view has always been, and it's a true point of view, is that demons don't have much power. They've been defeated at Easter. The only thing they can do is show us images. They show us pictures, essentially fantasies. We visualize what something's going to be like. We get a new job, we make money, we get a new girlfriend, something like that. We have this fantasy in our head, and it's usually false. It's usually never as good as we think it's going to be. 
it usually ends up costing us far more to follow that. Than, but at the time, when we have that image in our head, um, that's where temptation comes from. And it's really you can't really judge someone. It's really hard to blame someone when they fall. That's how demons function. They're images. It's like television, like mass marketing, um, uh, showing a picture and grabbing the the lower the lower passions in order to to manipulate somebody. That's a brutally tough weapon. We have the advantage, though, of seeing what this kind of stuff does. Just talking about the opium war, seeing where this stuff comes from, seeing the heaps of corpses that following your self-interest has created and had to happen for this to even be possible. That changes everything. It's like it's like pornography. You know, uh, I never got into that stuff because I know way too much about it. I know who controls it. I know what they do to those girls. I know how miserable those girls are. I know they're all drugged up. Once you learn that, all of a sudden it ain't so hot anymore. It ain't hot at all. By itself, if you have no weapons, if you don't know if you don't know what's going on, you think, oh my God, they're gorgeous, um, or getting high, it feels so great. They're all this money. I've got to look at the power I have. But once you know a thing or two about it, you know where this stuff leads. We know what's behind the curtain, so to speak. That's the weapon that we have that back then people didn't have. Yeah, if you grow up uh, in, like, in a healthy family, intact family, mother and father, and uh, uh, some religious instruction in, in these matters and you know, sexual ethics and morality, uh, you immediately know it's wrong. And you know it's uh, that just isn't a, 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 a healthy way to look at you know matters sexual, uh, but but if you live in a society where people are increasingly grow up in dysfunctional, broken families, uh, they're not going to have that that awareness or that consciousness or that background to make that this make that judgment. And so the blow, the lure of pornography is going to be even even stronger. And they know this is when they knew they knew this is the whole philosophy or right, guiding. Uh, plan behind you know the authoritarian personality where they you know, focus on the strong you know the uh, cohesive family with the strong father figure as the source of fascism, and so the way you you uh, uh, weaken or you uh, um, address the threat of fascism fascism is you destroy the family and weaken the father figure so everyone is atomized and they can be tempted by the lure of these things the lure of the passions. Uh, November, if you heard it like no nut November. Yes, I have. So people are, are for swearing pornography. You know, they're not watching pornography for the month of November. The reaction that was particularly interesting because the reaction, I think, uh, 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 affirmed the views of like E. Michael Jones that sexual liberation and pornography are psychological warfare. Is there a Psychology Today had an article that said if men didn't watch pornography and stop masturbating, they would become more aggressive and assertive. <laughs> <laughs> And then even Rolling Stone accused of being anti-Semitic, <laughs> which I laugh at this, but I realize, well, this goes back to Wilhelm Reich and the authoritarian personality. You know, his mass psychology of fascism, the way you corrupt society isn't by preaching Marx, is you get people thinking about sex and, you know, pornography and masturbation. And when you get people doing that, the you know, God evaporates from their mind and they're easily corrupted. And uh, that's what they've done with these things, and yeah, you know, uh, so they've been able to, you know, to uh, uh, through Hollywood. You're talking about images. Well, I think Hollywood, right? I mean, television, yeah, and the images, and how they can corrupt us with the magic, you know, with this black magic of Hollywood, and uh, they've done it, man. Uh, but awareness is very important. Consciousness breaks the spell. Yeah, and, and knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, but you know, Frank Zappa. Um, I quote him quite a bit because he blew open so much of the pop culture mentality. Mm -hmm. He said a rock concert is a brainwashing mechanism that everything's in blackness except the stage. The volume is very high. The lights are crazy, you know, lasers and all of this stuff. Their music being performed by guys you admire and you like legitimately. So everything else is cut off. You're, your normal life, your normal priorities, all that is gone for this short period of time. The psychological trauma, especially at the high volume, like the Who and Deep Purple, yeah. uh, Rush. I mean, I've, I've, God, I saw Rush for the first time in '94. I still have ring in my ears. <laughs> but that's there's a legitimacy there. The purpose of that, the purpose of that, is to break your interior, um, 
your interior mechanisms, your, your interior defense mechanisms. It's a, it's a trauma, so to speak. It's a matter of, and, and Zap is point in saying all this, that the lights and the volume and everything else, this is about creating suggestibility. So it is, you know, black magic, you're not kidding around. This is exactly what it's meant to be. And when um, you have Bob Dylan come right up in 60 Minutes saying that, yes, he signed a contract with the demonic power to become as powerful as he is. And most people, if you haven't seen that, it, it, it's, um, I think it's, it's still on, still on uh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. A lot of guys have seen that. He comes right out and says it. I made a deal with the man. But the, yeah, that's, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And you had guys like Michael Jackson saying something very similar. You had Bill Cosby saying something similar, uh, either about themselves or someone else, the, the field in general. And these guys end up in all kinds of trouble for saying it. Once you start realizing what goes into this stuff, you are, you are armed against it. It's still, it's still really hard to say no. I've always I've, – I've talked about our life, and I, I've used this metaphor many, many times. We are, we are alcoholics that are forced to work in a bar. We have no other option but to work in a bar. We can't drink because we know it's going to kill us. We're <laughs> surrounded by people who are having a great time. We have to work there. We're surrounded by alcohol. Everything looks great. And everyone – that's not bad enough though. People are coming up to us saying, oh, come on, come on. It's, it's good for you. Nothing's going to happen. So have fun. Let let loose for a while. So you have this whole idiot. So when you fall and you're going to fall, you know, how much of this is your fault? We are alcoholics who are forced to work in a bar. And that's why our life is, is going to be very difficult. And that's why the father figure, the family is so essential because we can guard children, as I did with my own kids, for a long period of time uh, against this kind of thing. The, the killing of the king ritual is one of the essential rituals of mm -hmm. the yeah. of modernity. I've been talking about this for years. Michael Hoffman's been talking about this for years. You mentioned the killing of, of, of the monarch uh, Charles or the monarch Louis or the monarch Nicholas II. The killing of the king is a ritual. It's breaking down the family. It's breaking down uh, natural law, creating this atomization with these elites and robber barons, but then reconstituting them in this collective controlled by these, these secret rulers, the people who control these images. So there's, a, there's three steps here, but that's exactly what this is. So any time that you engage and indulge in this kind of thing, that's who you're supporting. Um, so – and that's why not, not getting started and, – and this is, this is so absolutely essential. The, the opium – it's not an accident. We're talking about the opium war. We're talking about a drug. We're talking about getting people high. When I took uh, pain pills – for my root canal for the very first time, I remember I took one. It was a Percocet. And I said to my, my wife at the time, I said, now I know why people get addicted to this stuff. Because mm -hmm. all my problems floated away. It was a wonderful feeling. Um, it's really hard to say no to that. It's not an accident that we're talking about the opium war. We're talking about opiates. Um, getting high, but being able to and, and see how it was used to defeat the Chinese army. Because the fact that so many of these guys were high or dealing with addiction is one of the reasons it took them so long to mobilize their forces. You had elites, uh, generals and, and colonels in the, in, the, in the Manchu army who were either making money off the trade or into it themselves. So it's really hard for them to go fight. Um, then you add the ridiculous ideology of free trade and everything that the British press was saying at the time. You get the full civilization based on not just provoking these passions – but then justifying it, having this whole ideology of justification. So it's not just that we are alcoholics forced to work in a bar, but we're surrounded by people telling us that it's all okay, just let loose. And you mentioned the um, psych – I think I know the Psychology Today thing. Um, I, I think I've cited a couple of those things. It comes from B.F. Skinner, uh, and it comes from um, uh, the, uh, the Institute in the uh, University of Indiana. Um, the Kinsey Institute? The, the, the Kinsey Institute, who sees a behavior, is coming from the Skinner School. Mm -hmm. um, the Kinsey Institute, which – and he created it. He said, oh, no, men have to have sex or they go crazy. You have to do this. This is healthy for you. This is good for you. Of course, we know that's crap now, um, but it's still part of the, the postmodern way of thinking. Uh, uh, and, and, and Kinsey was, was really the first one to create this ideology around this. And to justify it, and of course he got Rockefeller funds to do it, mm -hmm. and so it all connects. We're talking about the modern world being based on the ability to provoke the lower passions, 
being having the money to make this seem like it's a legitimate thing to do and have a group of people who rule us, who make money off of it, who are into, the, into it themselves, and to be surrounded by people who tell us it's all okay. All of that was put into place uh, during and after the Opium Wars. It took a while. Uh, the Chinese eventually did reconstitute themselves, but China was broken. They never, they never recovered because in a short period of time, the Manchus were overthrown and the westernized uh, liberal you know, Sun Yat-sen took over. And then the Civil War and then Mao takes over in 49. Mm-hmm. China never recovered. And of course, never, I think never, Mao was educated. He was a yearly. <laughs> yeah, and Pol Pot was educated in, in, in France. Yeah, yeah. And Ho Chi Minh was educated in France. Uh, most of the most of the Marxists were Marx did, did his work both in Germany and, and in, in London. Uh, these guys, you know, th- these are these are aliens in, in, in all senses of the term. China never recovered from this. The Taiping Rebellion uh, caused 20 million people. Nothing was even close. That number of bodies at the time that was the bloodiest war in history. Uh, people don't know that much about it. It was it, it, an almost it, an insane orgy of violence. That comes from uh, the reaction against the opium wars internally to China. China was broken permanently because of this thing. That's the power this stuff has. This isn't about freedom of choice or free trade. That's the real price of this. Yeah, and to this very day, I mean, I mean, in the modern, more recent years, we have stories about the role of international uh, drug trade playing the role in you know banking and finance, uh, how it's launched through the through the money system, and probably. I'm sure it monetizes a lot of U.S. debt. Uh, and we had, I think, in 2009, Acosta, that U.N. report about what kept the banking system afloat in the crisis was the uh, liquidity quite about, uh, provided by the, the uh, drug trade. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was one of the first to popularize that idea. Mm-hmm. It's been around a while, but after the uh, collapse of, of 07, 08, um, I, think I, I mentioned the U.N. report in my article on Albania. I've been talking about this for a long time. It was the drug trade that kept the stock market going when liquidity was was just, you know, leaving the market and going elsewhere. Uh, it kept it from total collapse. The system has a great dependency on drug money. But this the drugs what, at the same time is destroying the society that supports the system. Yeah, so much for rationality. Huh? <laughs> that's the liberal order. <laughs> that's that's the liberal order. It, yeah. it at the moment of decision. You understand why people fall, but seen even from the medium term, let alone the long term, we see the destruction that this causes, and there has to be a militant response to this stuff. Um, you can't be nice about this because you think of the fight, you think of the, the passions that we're trying to fight. We have to be militant. You know, you have to be. You know, it has to be. Um, um, uh, it, it has to be. You have to be rough on yourself. You know, I, I wrote several papers now on the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, they had to be authoritarian and very, very tough on their people because they were broken from years mm-hmm. of war, their own drug addiction on the same uh, opiates. Uh, of course, they banned heroin and they put a pistol to a farmer's head and said, if you grow this stuff, I'm going to pull the trigger. And they didn't. And the UN says they brought their poppy crop down to zero mm-hmm. in a couple of years. Well, if they can do it, I'm pretty sure the U.S. government can do it if it wanted to. And the invasion of Afghanistan, of course, reconstituted the drug trade. Yeah, we're, we're, we're guarding the poppy fields. So the we're guarding the poppy fields. There's yeah. pictures of that. I, I, I have that. You know, uh, the Russian government has been talking about this for a long time, and this massive flood of heroin coming in from Afghanistan through Kosovo into Europe and and other other routes as well is what's fueling this drug. Uh, crisis that we're dealing with. It all seems to be based around opiates. Um, This comes from, to a great extent, the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Mm -hmm. The Taliban were actually restraining uh, many people from getting involved in in heroin. That's how significant these these groups are. But you have to be, when you have a broken society like Afghanistan was, you have to be authoritarian. You have to be rough about it. to, To stop the drug trade at that time and even today, you can't be nice about it, and and they weren't, and that's that. Unfortunately, that's essential now, not just with society, but we have to be that way with ourselves. 
Yeah, and there was a time, I think, in America where it wasn't a big problem, but then when society gets corrupted, you can't even rely on people's good judgment anymore because they've been so broken themselves, psychologically demoralized. And you know, talk about the opioid crisis in middle America, and a lot of that's part of the deindustrialization of the United States. A lot of it's also a lot of the war veterans, uh, but um, you create a situation of despair and hopelessness, and that's a that's a, you know that's a, a, a rich environment for drug addiction. We can't assume. I mean, part of the modern mentality is that people are inherently rational, which means that they know what their self interest is, and once they know that, they know how to stick to it and adopt the proper means to bring that about over time. We know how ridiculous that is, mm-hmm. and yet the entire, you know, modern idea, whether it be the free market, or political democracy, or individual choice, all this stuff is based on that absurdity. The the drug crisis, the drunk driving, uh, alcoholism, all this stuff, um, it comes from self destruction. That's one thing Freud was right about. I mean, it, it's people you can't rely on reason. These drives are more powerful. When you have a world, I mean, that's one of the things that the Frankfurt School did. You mentioned that you can't just preach Marx to people. You can't talk in you know abstractions. The Frankfurt School used Marx and Freud and combined them using the sexual drive as the foundation. Antonio Gramsci did the same thing mm-hmm. to break down the, the barriers uh, that keep the society functioning. A revolution can't have those barriers in existence. It has to be destroyed. That's what the late 60s was all about. And this was financed by the regime, financed by uh, Rockefellers and, and Rothschilds. Every book that the Frankfurt School put out, uh, Herbert Marcuse, who I read quite a bit, has a Rockefeller Foundation grant right in the acknowledgments. Mm-hmm. This is coming from big money. There's a reason for that. They're thinking long term. They know that for, for them to continue to make money and to continue to rule, they have to be the only source of happiness for people. It has to be all based on money and and power and some some lower drive, greed, or something like that, that they then have access to. And they will allow you to pursue that for a fee. And that's what the economy is based on. It is not based on reason, but in marketing, in advertising. Are they, <laughs> approach, are they approaching consumers as rational beings? No, they're approaching them as purely passionate yeah. beings. Yeah. Like, so the, the ideology of modernity, that this, we're supposed to be uh, these rational actors, uh, yeah, yeah. Our, our life... It, the whole system is based on exactly the opposite. Edward, it's a Ed, contradiction. Yeah, Edward Bernays demonstrated that. Freud's uh, nephew. Uh, yeah, you. Which E. Michael Jones talked about at, at some length in Libido Dominante. Yeah. yeah, marketing is uh, marketing is a very sick. I can't believe that they're actually having that as an academic field. You could actually get a bachelor's degree in marketing. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? Uh, that's a mockery of, of of academia. It's the opposite of 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 scholarship. It's it's about manipulating people into doing things. That they would normally not do. That's all that marketing is. The things they think also worse things they shouldn't do. It's back to that whole idea of the moral principles and philosophy of what guides the economy. Um, because there there are economically uh, productive and also uh, uh, sustainable ways of living. It may not be a quite as fast and may not be you know as fun. Uh, but uh, you might know, talks about in uh, Baron Metal how. You know, with the uh, 1970s and the um, creation of the divorce culture and the dual income, feminism, and this coupled with the uh, sort of the macroeconomic environment where uh, you know where wages were stagnating, inflation was going up, and debt was rising. Of course, the other side of debt is the offer of credit, and this um, necessitated the dual income. So when you have two people working, um, um, and all of a sudden, the consumption patterns of the, of the couple no longer are, g- are guided towards the child. It's it's towards consumption. Right. It's to Harley Davidson's the vacation, and that is <laughs> that does not the same objective, right? It's not the same investment. And your quality of your investment in children is going to have a different outcome than buying a, a nicer car or a vacation. And that you know this is the again the the economic um, the moral path of the you know the uh, of the of the economic system, as opposed to just self interest and you know. Accumulating wealth, so the, the whole the whole boomer mentality, and yeah. I thank God every day that I skipped it. My parents were born in the '30s, I was born in '71, so I skipped it on two sides. Thank God. <laughs> yes. But the entire boomer mentality. When you mentioned Harley Davidson, come on, that's 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 yes. like their their symbol. <laughs> um, the boomer mentality is based entirely on credit. Yeah. And we could live big now, 
that by the time the bill comes due, we're going to be dead. Yeah, nothing for posterity. Yeah, that's 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 the culture of death. Well, I've had you a long time this afternoon. Thank you. Um, so, um, this paper you're working on, you're going to publish that soon, or? That's a really good question. Um, you know, a lot of stuff has already been done on it in the mainstream world, mm -hmm. but there's a few things they won't mention. Uh, it'll probably end up in the Barnes Review. Okay. That's what I'm going to be doing here. And again, if you guys aren't subscribing, you can't get this stuff online anywhere. I strongly recommend it, even though I'm a little biased. 20 years ago, almost exactly 20 years ago, I was hired by them. Uh, it's a first-rate publication. And uh, there are an occasional hard copy journal you just kind of have to have because you can't get it anywhere else. It is peer-reviewed, at least in the major the major um, essays because I'm one of the peer reviewers there. I made just one of the reasons I was hired. Um, it's a serious publication, and uh, this is the kind of thing that we do all the time. E. Michael Jones' Culture Wars, I can't, I can't recommend it enough. And, of course, all Michael Hoffman's stuff. Um, this is this is the counter revolution is happening with with us. I'm proud to say, and despite the suffering that we have to go through to make it happen, um, we are teaching you know younger people, even older people. Uh, this is the foundation of this world that we take for granted. Yes. Um, so uh, again, you can. Uh, yeah, I know you, you have a podcast or a radio program of this very topic that I can link to on the Opie Moors. People go listen to that. And that's, that does cover a lot of the material in the article that, that you're penning now. So I can, I can direct people in that direction. They also follow your work at the RushJournal.org, correct? Yeah, you know, I'm the worst self-promoter in the world. <laughs> I could go through an entire interview and never mention anything I'm doing. Um, yeah, RushJournal.org, uh, R-U-S Journal. Um is it's one stop shop. You get all my books are there, all my essays are there, mm -hmm. the Patreon is there, and most importantly, the PayPal donation button is there. This kind of thing, this is a full time job. You cannot do this part time. This is the kind of thing you can't do this in your spare time. This is a constant 12 hour a day, seven days a week, in my case, 30 years. It'll be 30 years in January, uh, non stop work to be able to build this kind of intellectual repertoire. It doesn't just happen. Uh, Hoffman, myself, uh, poor Joe, Joe Schaub, all of us, we are, we are full-time guys. We don't have universities. We don't have churches. We don't have think tanks. We don't have governments. We don't have lots of rich guys. We have the listeners. So I am begging you to assist us financially so we can continue to do this and live this life and warn young people um, that this society isn't worth fighting for. It isn't worth anything and has to be replaced. Okay, great. Listen, I'll, uh, I'll post this soon. I do. I'll send you the link. Please do. And we'll, uh, so I will wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Same to you, my friend. It was a lot of fun as it always is. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, good afternoon then. Bye-bye. Same to you, my friend.